Let us go back to John 7. I say back because we were there last Sunday. Huh? John 7. Let us go from verse 37. John 7, verse 37. We're going to go until the end of the chapter, but you guys will see that the last verse, I'm not going to pay attention to that verse because I think that verse, maybe, maybe it's more connected with the next chapter. We're going to read it. It kind of brings an ending to chapter 7, but I think it has an even stronger connection with chapter 8. But anyways, when God wrote, when God gave us the Bible, He didn't give us with verses, right? He didn't give us with chapters. He did not even give us with binding, okay? With glue here. So I, I, I don't mind that much. So let us go to John chapter 7. We're going to read from verse 37. Until the end of the chapter, let us remember this is the second sermon on this passage. Let us read these words for the praise of God's name and for our edification. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard the saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. So far the reading of the word of the Almighty God. Last sermon we saw a lot of things on this, on this section here. We focused on verses 37, 38, 39, and f no, not 40, un until 39, last Sunday. We saw when, that when Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, that, that if, it's not really, uh, oh, maybe, you know, by the chance of perhaps one day, maybe. No, no, no. It's, it's said if, but it refers to a certainty. People do thirst after God, whether they acknowledge or not, whether they even know it or not. God, when made mankind, made them with a go with a a, a God-sized hole on their souls that only God Himself can fill. And we saw that Jesus calls people freely. Did you know He was in the middle of the feast? Did He check one by one who was there? Did He go one by one and say? Mm, yeah, what I'm saying doesn't apply to you, but all of you. It was a crowd. And he just stood up and said, if anyone thirsts. So Jesus welcomes, he calls freely anyone to come to him. We also saw that Jesus made matters very simple, right? Did you see how straightforward the invitation was? If you're thirsty, come and drink. Not a complex, the gospel is not a complex gospel. It is a simple gospel. We need Christ. Very simple. We saw that Jesus is God himself. 
You cannot offer God if you are not God yourself. You cannot offer me to somebody else because you are not me. But I can offer myself to somebody else because I am myself. So that is a possibility. That is the only possibility. We saw that Jesus not only is God, but he gives God. I can give you plenty of myself in a relationship, in a conversation, in an assistance, because I am myself. Jesus can give God because guess what? He is God. We saw that the Holy Spirit last Sunday, we saw that the Holy Spirit lives in the believer. So the believers have a fantastic privilege of access to the presence of God. It's, it's even better. How far away does it take you to access one that lives inside of you? It is, no time is involved. It's an automatic connection. We also saw that those that have the Spirit can speak about the Spirit to others. We also saw that the Holy Spirit is an ever-flowing source inside the believer. So once somebody believes in Christ, hears what he can never say. I don't know how can I approach God. Or if you are a believer, see, if you are a believer, you may even feel that you are alone. You may feel that. Yes, you do. You may. But here's one thing that will never be the case. That you shall actually be alone. No. The Spirit is an ever-flowing source. Is an ever-self-replenishing source of God Himself inside of you. In nature, we have no equivalent. Only in the creator of nature. Only in the maker of nature. And we also saw last Sunday that the Holy Spirit came after Christ. We saw there that the Holy Spirit was going to come after Christ was glorified. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. I need you to keep a finger there on John 7 and flip a few pages to John 14 with me. Flip a few pages on your Bible and read John 14 with me. On verse 26, when Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, quite, quite obvious, right? The Holy Spirit, we know who we're talking about. Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I said to you. This is the ministry, the task, the duty, the activity of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do in you? We see, we see right here. He will cause you to remember all things that Christ has said. What is the Holy Spirit doing inside the believer? He's saying, believer, remember Jesus. Jesus is this. Jesus is that. Jesus is God. Jesus is your, is this answer to your, to your life. So that is the ministry of the Spirit. To constantly take your eyes and say, look, look at Jesus. That is Jesus. Look that way. The, the ministry of the Spirit is to point to Christ forever. And never. Have you noticed that on the Bible, the Holy Spirit never brings attention to himself? Phenomenal. God, the Father, brings attention to himself. Jesus brings attention to himself. But the Holy Spirit is always like this. Take a look at Christ. That is the ministry of the Spirit. So those who have the Holy Spirit, they are ever more motivated by the Spirit to look to Jesus. To look to Jesus. And lastly, the Holy Spirit's task is to make you like Jesus. Now, you were, we just were in John 14, right? Now flip two pages more. Let's go to John 16. Just a few, ver two chapters ahead. John 16, verses 7 and 8. Take a look at that. Nevertheless, Jesus is speaking here. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. That sounds crazy, isn't it? It looks like Jesus is crazy here. Jesus is saying, look, guys, look, my dear disciples, my beloved disciples, I'm going to go away, and that is to your advantage. It sounds crazy. I think if I were there, I would have said, Jesus, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, really? But you see, Jesus is never wrong. So he said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, 
He will, oh, now we have the activity here. We have the list of the activities of the Spirit. Look at this. He will convinc convict the world of sin, number one. End of righteousness, number two. End of judgment, number three. Now, these three things are pretty much synonyms of each other. The overlap among these three is great. It's not a list. It's a, it's a one-item list that is referred to in three different manners. So the Holy Spirit will do this. will change you. The, the, the duty of the Holy Spirit is to transform Felipe and cause Felipe to be way less Felipe and way more Jesus. That, that is what the Holy Spirit does in the life of believer. Now, isn't that so countercultural? A lot of a lot of music, a lot of poems in our society nowadays are bombarding this same idea. You gotta be yourself. Well, you come here this morning, and here's my message to you. Please don't ever be yourself. Be Jesus. You have no other duty in life. You have no other duty in life. That's your only one. All the others may come as a side, as a consequence of that. And if you focus on that, oh my, oh my, what a beautiful job we shall do, we shall do on the others. Now let us look at the details of verse 41, 40 and 41 onwards. Look at what happened there. Therefore, well, Jesus had just made a fantastic statement. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. Now, what I thought about this is that they were saying six and a half a dozen. I thought they were saying the same thing. But after doing some studying, after, after researching this, um, not really, no? not really. At that time, wrongly so, they believed that there was such a thing as, the, as a spiritual messiah, which sometimes was connected to the prophet, capital P, the prophet that Moses spoke about. Remember when we talked about this some time ago? Moses, I think in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, I was, God will raise a prophet like myself. And that is greater than I. You, you're going to hear him. Some people saw that prophecy of Moses and they understood that Moses was talking about the Messiah. Some people thought that the Messiah, even though it's spoken about, guys, Genesis 3 speaks about the Messiah, okay? So it's way before Moses. So some people thought that there was such a thing as the Messiah and then the prophet of Moses. And some people even thought about the third one. That would be like a, a, a military, a, a political leader. And by the way, that was perhaps the one that they really wanted to arrive. Now, we know today that was only one person that was promised. At that time, there were these wrong notions that it was more than one. That's why they're saying, no, this is the prophet. No, oh, Moses' prophecy is being fulfilled right now. Some are saying, no, 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 not that one. This is the Christ. This is the other guy. Now, we know he, this was the only Messiah. That's why they have this division here. But some said, still in verse 41, will the Christ come out of Galilee? True, true. The, the Christ was not going to come out of Galilee. The Christ was going to come out of Bethlehem. There is a prophecy in the prophet Micah stating, Oh, Bethlehem, you, see, you shall see great light. And the people in the Old Testament knew that that was a reference to the Messiah. If you do a nice study on that section of Micah, you will quickly notice that indeed the, prof, the Messiah is being promised to the city of Bethlehem. So people, had a, the people didn't know what to do. Now here's a crucial part. Was that difficult to find out? How long does it take to come to somebody and ask, Hey man, where were you born? They're perfectly capable of doing that. Remember John the Baptist? On this book here, on this God, the Gospel of John chapter 1, John the Baptist, they came to him, John, are you the Messiah? And John quickly said, No, I'm not. 
However, I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm preparing the way, but I'm not. So they did their due diligence. How long does it take to find out? Jesus was all the time. Crowds were following him. All the, all the Sanhedrin, all the Pharisees, all the Sadducees needed to do was to send one representative and ask, can you tell me your birthplace, please? We want to settle a situation. That's all it took. That's all it took. But for them, there was one too much. Let me tell you, let me tell you this. Unbelief begins in the heart. Unbelief is not a problem of the intellect, almost never. Honestly, in my opinion, almost never. It's crucially, mostly, mainly a problem of the heart. The heart that doesn't want to believe. You may think, now, and you see, the, their speech is often, it looks like these people are bipolars. Sometimes the Pharisees would come to Jesus and say, Jesus, don't keep us in suspense. Are you the Messiah or not? And then Jesus replies, I have told you a gazillion times who I am. The problem is that you don't believe me. The problem was never Jesus. See, the problem was never the intellect. See, I'm not a person that I, I don't tend to praise other people's intellect that easily. But let me tell you this. Often our problem is not the lack of intelligence. Almost never. The problem is unbelief. It's an attitude of the heart in saying, I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe it. So we continue. We, get, we come to verse 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? Answer to this question? Yes, the Bible says exactly that. Observe the following. The people, the people knew the, the theology. Surprise, surprise. People are asking the correct questions. Hold on. The Bible says the Messiah should be born in Bethlehem. The knowledge was there. The knowledge, they knew. Philippi, we have a problem here. Bad theology. They knew. They knew. The theology was correct. If the Messiah had not been born in Bethlehem, well, the Bible cannot, can never lie. It's impossible. So that guy's not the Messiah. End of story. The theology was right. What was wrong? The heart. Because they knew the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, and they did not, took a few steps. Jesus, I, 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 there's something that is eating me alive, man. I, I need to know. Tell me, where were you born? Your birth, not where you grew up, your birthplace. When your mother gave birth to you, what is the geographical location? That's all it took. The problem was an issue of the heart. Now, that's not what you're going to hear outside. And by the way, this is not a new thing. I'm sure you have heard of a very famous guy called Socrates. You heard of the guy, right? Here's a sentence from Socrates. <clears throat> there is only one good knowledge and one evil ignorance no 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 they were not ignorant they knew they were not ignorant and yet they were evil they had the knowledge the knowledge necessary was given they possessed it the problem was the heart. The heart that was unwilling to bend. Unwilling to bend. Now we come to verse 43. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now I need you to keep a finger on John 7. And please now let us go to a little bit before that. Luke. Luke 12. We need to go to Luke 12 now, please. Luke 12, verse Verses 51, 2, and 3. Luke chapter 12, verses 51, 52, and 53. 
So remember on John 7, we just read that there was a division among the people because of him, correct? Look at what, the, what Luke tells us. Remember, Luke, Luke was not an apostle. Luke was uh, one writing under the authority of the apostle Paul. Luke chapter 12, verses 51, 52, 53. And so it says, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? Jesus is asking a question. Do you suppose, do you suppose that I came here to make things calm down? This is, Jesus is asking this question. The answer is, I tell you, not at all. Oh, isn't that a... a no, that's the kind of question that I think if Jesus would say no, which he did, that he would try to kind of come easy, you know, like, like, like go slowly. Like, like you want to tell somebody that their mother died. You say, you know, you know, you remember that your mother was maybe a bit sick. You kind of go very slowly, right? To soften the blow. But Jesus did not soften the blow at all. He said, do you think I came to bring peace? Not at all. Not at all. Guys, why am I emphasizing this? Because Jesus emphasized that. If Jesus would have said no, I would have said just no. But he said, not at all. But rather, division, my goodness, he, not only he said absolutely not on, on that, but pres, precisely the opposite. Not because Jesus is uh, revealing himself as the troublemaker, no. But Jesus is saying, I am a figure that people will be divided over me. Continuing, verse 52. For from now on, Five in one house will be divided. Three against two and two against three. How many families happen to be to suffer like that? Guys, read reports of, Chris, of people, of Muslims that become Christians in, in, in nations where Islam is the majority. It's, you read the reports, it's almost copy and paste. It looks like you can write one report that everybody... It fits. It's always the same story. I had to run away from my home because my brother or my father or my uncle said they were going to kill me because I came to Christ. It's always like that. It's not just one isolated event. No, no, no. It's, it's the rule. It's the rule. It, in Brazil, I remember people that I've met, they said, when, when I came to Christ... My, my family did such and such. My dad did such and such. My mom did such and such. One great friend of mine from, from, from India, he comes from a very wealthy family. The day he became a Christian, they cut him off. He became poor overnight. Like, when I say poor, I mean destitute. Like, he had the clothes on his body. Because he became a Christian. That's it. That's, that's all he did. Continuing, verse 53, father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Now, when you see Jesus repeating himself over and over and over and over and over, you think, okay, okay, man, I got it. Why, why is he like, because the matter is a serious one. The matter is so serious that he, he's saying over and over so that, so that we get it. Jesus' point is not, I will stir up trouble. Mm -mm. His problem is, people will raise trouble because of me. That's his point. Make no mistakes. If you want to live like Jesus, if you want to believe in Jesus, and especially if you want to talk to Jesus, uh, talk Two people about Jesus, which, by the way, shame on me if I don't do it. Shame on anyone who doesn't do that. Because that's the clear commandment of Scripture. If we do that, expect to be criticized. Expect that. You may think, Felipe, then re sure, should I really do it? And the answer is yes. Yes. Now, let me try to encourage you in that regard. Often, 
I have found that often, and I'm speaking about myself a little bit at least, most, also in the past, mostly in the past, sometimes I would find myself a little bit embarrassed to talk about Jesus because I cared about other people's opinions and I thought, what, what are those people going to think about me? But later on, a friend of mine made a statement that, you know when somebody not turns on the light, it looks like they remove the roof and the sun shines right on your face? That's how I felt when he made that comment. And here's what he said. Why in the world the opinion matters to you? Look, look at them. Do you want to have their life? See, they live day by day without the knowledge of God. Do you envy anything at all there? And I said, no, I don't, I don't envy them at all. And then he said, then why in the world would their opinion be worth a milligram to you? Like, why? Why? They, you, you, ab, you abhor everything they stand for. Then all of a sudden their opinion is important to you. What's wrong with you? That's what he said to me. It was the most liberating statement in my life. Maybe not the most, but maybe top three. And I thought, yeah, why would I care about their opinion? I, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be like them at all. In fact, I want to be so much the opposite of them. But why would their opinion matter at all? See, I can say I carry the words of living life because I know how to copy Jesus. I know how to repeat his words. So I know the words of life because I can repeat his words. The words don't come from me, come from Jesus. So why? why? I, see, I want to care about Jesus' opinion of me. My father used to tell me this a thousand times when he would tell me to do things. And I would say, Dad, I don't know what my friends would say about that. And he would look at me with a very serious face and say, who pays your bills, boy? And I'll say, you pay my bills. Said, then you care about what I think. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that spot on? Like, my friends, they, they don't pay any bills of mine at all. They never gave me money. No friend of mine ever came to me on school. Talking about school time. Felipe, here's a hundred bucks. Nobody ever did. Why? My father did that. Multiple times. Dad, I care about your opinion, not theirs. So it's like the Lord. Metaphorically speaking, who gives you the currency of heaven? Who makes you rich in the eyes of God? Who gives you, who promises streets of gold? Jesus. Other people, have anybody else have promised you streets of gold, really? Have anybody else promised you eternity? Have anybody else promised you a perfect body and soul? Double. Have anybody made that promise to you? No, I'm sure not. Jesus has promised that. Then we care about his opinion. Then we care only about his opinion. All the others are noise. Like yada, 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 yada. Then we continue. And we see somebody that got the idea. On this text, we have somebody that got the the idea. But by the way, verse before I get to verse 45, I'm sorry. Verse 44. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Why? Because it was not the time of the Lord. If you go back on the same chapter, uh, actually go there with me on the same chapter. Let me see here. Verse 30. Therefore they sought to, to take him. See, on the same speech, people tried to grab him twice. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. The Bible states that the hairs on our head are numbered. That's a marvelous statement. I heard, I think about a week ago, that an adult loses about, uh, I, think, I don't know, if I think it was at least eight hairs a day. Of course, they, they grow. They grow back, theoretically. So the, why Jesus chose this reference, you lose the hair, your hairs are numbered? Because there is something like, I mean, if you go a little bit and shake your hair, 
lot to fall. It sounds like something so random, so like, yeah, of course, here it falls, that's it. Why Jesus chose that? Because it's something so like, yeah, yeah, it's happening all the time, like, like the, the motion of my hand. They're like, who cares if you move, moved a little bit like here or here? So he chose something so daily, so mundane to say, even that God is counting. Point being, God's control over all matters is absolute. So Jesus was not taken because it was not the time that God had appointed for him to be taken. Why have Jesus not returned yet? I'm sure you have prayed for Jesus to come back. I have prayed for Jesus to return and return quickly. A gazillion times. Why has Jesus not returned yet? Because it's not the appointed time yet. Simple. Simple, simple, oh, so very simple. And now we come to verse, um, let me see, 45. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? Why? You, we sent you guys with a mission. You came back with the mission not accomplished. Justify yourselves. And the justification is quite a phenomenal. And honest. And honest. No man ever spoke like that. That is so true. No man ever spoke like Jesus. No preacher has ever preached 0.0001% as good as Christ. If you put all the apostles combined, they did not make 0.0001% of one letter of Christ. God teaching, that's when Jesus opened his mouth. God is teaching. No one spoke like this. Now observe here a few more things. Note here, and I say this with fear and trembling, and you're going to understand very quickly why I'm saying what I'm saying. Religious leaders can be evil, very evil sometimes. I'm saying this, I know, I know exactly what I am, okay? <laughs> Religious leaders can be phenomenally evil. Phenomenally. The guards, well, who were these guards? They, they were Levites. They were, they were people that knew the law. But they were not the top guys. They were not the top guys. They were not the most knowledgeable of all. They were not those guys with five PhDs on their shoulders. They were not. They maybe had one. They knew. They knew the Bible. But they were not the top guys. Yet, the top guys remained hard as stone. And they wanted... To pervert the lower guys. And the lower guy said, sorry, man. Sorry. Have you heard the guy speaking? It's phenomenal. These guards, these Levites, they were accustomed to doing rough stuff. This, This was the temple guard. These are not wallflowers. These are tough guys. Guys that were accustomed to bring people to different locations that were kicking and screaming. They were accustomed to do that job. There was a day that was just a regular day. And yet they thought you know, now it's a regular order but that's a very irregular man. The religious leaders, they were less sensitive. Actually, they were not sensitive to the spirit at all. But those regular Jews, regular Levites, they were. So remember that. Religious leadership does not equate a good life with God. Once again, I know exactly, <laughs> I know who is the one that is speaking this right now. 
I'm a pastor and here, here I am criticizing religious leaders. But it's true. Religious leaders can be awful at times. I have no illusion that some of you may pray a thousand times more than I do. I, I think so. I think some of you are way more sensitive to the Holy Spirit than I am. And I praise God. And I wish, I, 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 I wish, I really, I really wish, and I do pray, that I become the least knowledgeable man on this entire church. I wish that all of you guys pray much more than I. I wish that all of you guys love Jesus more than I. I wish that all of you guys pay attention to the sermon more than I do, <laughs> even though I'm the one preaching. I wish all of that. And, and maybe it's going to be like that. Hopefully it's going to be like that. It's going to be amazing if it's like that. We have here a situation in which Levites were way more sensitive to the spirit than their leaders. Religious position does not make a Christian. So be humble yourself. Oh, I have been attending this church for a hundred decades. So what? So what? These were the top of Judaism. So what? They were not sensitive to the spirit. Give me a new believer that really want to learn the Bible. I, I, I want that way. I, I, want to, I, want to be, I want to sit beside that guy way more than somebody that have heard a gazillion sermons and it's not sensitive. Let us be like that. Let us be sensitive to the spirit. So we continue. So we continue on verse. Uh, where are we now? Forgive me. Uh, oh, verse 47. Then the Pharisees answered them. Are you also deceived? I, I, are you, have you guys been duped as well? Did you guys buy that man's nonsense? Like, do, does, is your brain that weak? Are you guys so weak in resolution that you guys bought it? That's what you're saying here. But what should have been said is, oh, back at you, man. Have you been duped by your religiosity that you don't recognize that God is before you? And I, I find it fascinating that they protest a lot, isn't it? They, they, they really protest. They say, have you been deceived as well? A, a kind of weak-minded person are you? And then on 52, when, when Nicodemus, one of them, by the way, one of, one of the top guys, Nicodemus was one of the top guys. And Nicodemus politely, gently said, you know, maybe, maybe we should hear the guy. And they say, are you from Galilee as well? See, they're so rude. They're so angry. That shows, that, that shows a hidden agenda, isn't it? When, when people protest too much, don't, isn't that how it usually goes? When somebody protests too much, you think like, mm, not sure about that anymore. That's what they're doing here. They're protesting a lot. They're protesting a lot. A friend of mine once went through this. He was interested on this girl. And this girl gave me such a no, such a strong no. It was such a phenomenal no. And she said no so many times, so repeatedly, that, if, that he said, no, I think you actually mean yes, because you're protesting too much. Not going to tell the end of the story. <laughs> Are you deceived as well? And now... Instead of giving a biblically based reply, they bring a fallacy. Look at the fallacy. You, you know what's a fallacy, right? A fallacy is a false argument. It looks like it makes sense. But no, a fallacy is a false, false argument. For example, I'll give an example of, of a fallacy. Uh, this... Window is purple. Felipe, it's not purple. It's wooden color. No, it's purple. Here's my argument. My dad said it's purple. So what? If your dad all of a sudden says that 2 plus 2 equals 15, 
That's it. So it's, for example, in this case, we have the, the fallacy of authority. You are arguing from authority. Because that guy, and that guy is a big shot, and that guy said B. Therefore, B is right. Now, if, if, our, if an authority all of a sudden says, well, sun rises at midnight, does that make it so? This is a fallacy. Just because Mr. Bob said, it doesn't make it true. Now, somebody that is tiny bit trained in the Bible knows the following. It is the case because of, let me show it to you. You flip the pages, flip the pages. Flip the, there you go. That's the bare minimum that somebody that knows the Bible uh, replies. That's the bare minimum reply. And they said, these are the top, remember, these are the top guys. And instead of giving a wonderful, well-argued answer, they say, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? Really? So the reply is, well, the top guys don't buy it. So, therefore, you should not buy it. Really, you, you, you would expect better from these people, wouldn't you? You would expect them to come up with a more convincing argument. That's the kind of people that don't love the word of God. Yes, guys, and let me tell you this. These guys here, these top guys here, they knew the entire Old Testament. I'll say this one more time. They knew the entire Old Testament by heart. If you'd come to one of them and say, Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 5, he would say, uh, Tum. they knew everything by heart. And yet, the best argument they have is, oh, my teacher said that. Or my mommy said so. Do not be like that. I'm criticizing them, but I want to criticize us. I want to criticize you. I want to criticize me. Here's what the apostle, I think the apostle Peter said. I think it was Peter. Always, always, always means always. Always be ready to give an answer to those that have that ask you for a reason of your faith. Good sir, good ma'am, why are you a Christian? Your answer has to be here. I am a Christian because of that, guys. That's not my idea. The apostle Peter said that. And these guys here didn't have that. Now Nicodemus on verse 15. Oh, forgive me. Now comes to the for my favorite verse here. Oh, this is amazing. Look at verse 49. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Phenomenally arrogant. Phenomenally puffed up. Puffed up. First of all, what the point that we're making here is, these people do not have formal theological education, but we do. Therefore, we are hotshots. They are less than nothing. They're not less than nothing. They are accursed. They, they, they are, because nothing is just nothing. Accursed is worse than nothing. They are, they're less than nothing. They're, they're way down. That's what they're saying. Why? Because they don't have, the, they did not go to our schools. They do not attend our institutions. Can you smell the pride of the institution here? They, they were, these are the guys that you would expect them to have a tattoo of the seminary there. So proud. But they didn't love any of that. It was, they loved the institution. They loved the appearance. They loved the facade. Not the message. Not the God. Not the scripture. 
That's, that's what they're saying here. The top guys don't believe in Jesus. The crowds believe in Jesus. But who cares about the crowds? They are all accursed. That, that's their opinion. We have the top guys on our corner. Therefore, we are right. Have you heard that before? I'm sure you have. Now, another, here's why I find this verse fascinating. This verse tells us a lot about the human psyche. And as I speak, I, I very much want to encourage you to think of a mirror right now. Please, I beg of you, think of a mirror right now. Let me tell you why. why let me tell you what this, this tells us about the human psyche. Whose job was to teach the crowds? Whose job was? Their jobs. Their jobs. So let me tell you what, what's happening here. Look, we are, we are put here by God to teach the crowds. The crowds know nothing. Yikes. But it was their job to cheat, to teach the crowds. So they failed on their job. And whose fault is it? The other guy. That, that's human psyche for you. That... What a shame. What a shame. Now imagine. See, I'm, I've been the preacher on this pulpit for a f- number of years, right? Imagine if I go around telling everybody, you know, the people of that church there, that people don't even know which one comes first, Old Testament or New Testament. They don't even know that. Let's say I go around saying things like this. Oh, shame on me. Why didn't I teach then? Shame on me. I should have taught them. If I would have done a better job in teaching them, they would know which one comes first, the Old or the New Testament. That people there don't even know the name of the Messiah. Oh, shame on their leader. That should have taught them. Now imagine if I go shaming you because I didn't do my job. And imagine coming the, the, the final day, the judgment day, and I, my brother likes to say this, Philip, imagine that movie playing on the big screen on Judgment Day. Felipe not doing his job, and Felipe criticizing the people that never learned because he never taught. Imagine that movie. And me watching that movie. Now, I can complain if I teach and you don't listen. And I can, and I should, and I must. I will say this one more time. I can, should, and I must. If I teach and you don't listen. But if I don't teach, if I don't devote myself to the craft of teaching the word of God, which right do I have to complain that you do not hear, that you do not understand? Furthermore, How can we complain when our children don't learn the word of God? If we don't come to them and say, hey, sit down here. Why? Sit down. I'm going to read the Bible to you. Are you understanding? Now explain to me. What did you hear? Okay, that's good. Next. We ought to do that. Shame on us when we don't do that. And we think, why are my children like that? I'll, I'll tell you why they are like that. Now, once again, sometimes you find a family where mommy and daddy love the Lord, and they have, let's say, five kids. Four of them love Jesus, and one is an atheist. Is that the f- fault of the parents? Well, obviously not. You can see. You can see. Moses, he loved God. And look at his children. David, he loved God. Look at his children. There is that. There is that. But in general, in general, guys, I'm not saying it's a fast rule. In general, those that teach well tend to find, tend to have students that learn well. In general, I repeat. So we continue with Nicodemus. I don't know what's going on with Nicodemus here. I really don't know. When I read this, I think maybe he's still shy. Maybe he's still a coward. I don't know. 
Remember when he came to Jesus on John chapter 3? He came at night. You know, he hiding, you know, stealth, stealth mode. And now here, look at, look at how beaty around the bush he is. Take a look. Does our Lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? He's asking a rhetorical question. Now, we know the answer. The people there knew the answer. It was obvious. By the way, the Old Testament do have, no, maybe not a direct reference, but an indirect reference to hearing the parties. Even Proverbs says, one man can, one man can say, A, 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 but you cannot be sure until you hear the other party. The book of Proverbs, I'm paraphrasing, of course. The book, the book of Proverbs speaks about the wisdom of hearing both parties. And Nicodemus is trying to very gently approach the topic. I do not know if Nicodemus was being a coward or if he was just trying to be smart here. He had before him uh, an unbelieving leadership, so maybe he's trying to slowly move them to another position. I don't know. I don't want to criticize the guy, and I don't want to praise the guy either. I do not know what's on his mind. I know what he said. If you ask me, Philippe, what do, what do you feel in your gut when you read this? I feel that he, I would like to have seen a bit more, you know, like, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe he was doing what he could have done best on the position. But the protest, boy, the, 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 the backlash, oh, he was strong. Look at verse 52. Are you also from Galilee? Uh, guys, for a Jew... Huge offense. Huge offense. It, it's, it's like saying, like, are you, are you of low stock? Are you like brain damaged as well? That, that's more or less what they mean here. They, they want to offend. They, they want to make the guy feel low, small, diminished. They, they want to offend him. Search and look. For no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Now, I believe... Some translations say, no prophet arises from Galilee. What I think that this means here is, what they mean here is very much what they said before. It should come from Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in Judea, not Galilee. But if you look at the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes, each tribe, all the tribes have produced a prophet. All of them. I'm not actually, I don't have this information from myself. I, I'm quoting uh, an ancient rabbi. He said, no of, none of the tribes have failed to produce prophets. But I believe what he's, he, what he's referring here is Nicodemus. What did you have for breakfast this morning, my friend? Like, wake up. The guy is from Galilee. No prophets rise from Galilee. End of story. I think, I think that's what the ascension could do. However, they're wrong. They're wrong. They, they create in Jesus an image. They, they create on their heads an image about Jesus, and they run with it. Let me tell you a secret. I was very much like that. I used to hate churches with a passion. By the time that, I, before I was a Presbyterian, was a, I was a nominal, nominal Catholic. And nominal is kind of a compliment to what I was. I was less than a nominal Catholic. And I hated churches with a passion. I hated the Catholic church. I liked God in my head. In my head. <laughs> but I hated the Catholic church and I hated the Presbyterian church even more. Why? Because one day I was invited to the Presbyterian church and I was a teenager, less than a teenager, I was what? I was 10. And all the friends at the church, at the church there, first time I was there, nobody spoke with me and I felt lonely there. And it was two hours Sunday school. So I was surrounded by people my age and I felt the, the person on my left turned around and started talking to the other guy. The person on my right turned around and started talking to the other guy. 
in my head with the passing of the years. That grew into such a, such a hatred. I, I, guys, I, if somebody would have told me, let's burn a church, I would say, oh, can I please throw the first match? Can I please? That, I hate the church. I hate the church with my passion. It changed a bit. <laughs> and I had all of that because of one experience in my head. Whose fault was that? Now, the people in the church should not have done that. I think that's beyond dispute. But it was my hatred, it was my evil heart that took a sad, sad event and blew that out of proportion. And it was my hatred that made me blind to the fact that I cannot claim to love God while I claim to hate the bride of God, which is the church. The Bible calls the church the mother of believers. See, it's such a small, a small event. I invented that if my children go through that, I'll tell them, you know, you know, try again. You know, make, make an effort. Make, if they don't talk to you, you know what? You talk to them. Try better perfume next time. I don't, you know, put, put your back into it, man. You know, don't give up. It's first one you know, throwing the towel in the first one. Really? That would have been wisdom. But my hatred blew that into, I hate the church. See, unbelief is a problem of the heart. It's not here, it's here. Let's end the sermon. Do you have this attitude of unbelief? Do you have that? Do you have a predisposition to not believe? I think you do, because why? Because you are a human. I think I do. In fact, I know I do. I'm predisposed to not believe. I'm very much like that. But I, I want to pray more and more that Christ would make me even more inclined towards him. When you become a believer, yes, indeed, you are inclined towards Christ. But the old man still pulling you back. You want to be inclined towards God and the old man keeps pulling you back. Like Augustine once said very, in a very smart way, I think it was Augustine, he said, I thought the old man had drowned in the waters of baptism. But the guy knew how to swim. Yeah. The, the old man, the old man want to take us to unbelief. And remember, guys, the belief is not complex. Jesus said, Do you want, are you thirsty? Come, drink. The plan cannot be more straightforward. Number two. Do you do your due diligence? I'll repeat. Do you do your due diligence in searching to know more about Jesus? Do you do your job? Do you take it seriously? How many times have you read your Bible beginning from this cover and ending on this cover? How many times? Can you say, I'm a Christian that is thoroughly acquainted with my holy book. Can you say that? You must be able to say that. There is no limit to growing that. Yes. But there is such a thing as maturing, becoming mature in the knowledge of the Bible. Have you achieved that? That, that, that is a task for the day before yesterday. And lastly, are you humble towards those that know less than you knew? Are you humble towards them? When you encounter, when you have a conversation with somebody that knows the Bible, that knows theology less than you, or perhaps I don't know God at all, don't know the Bible at all, do you have a humble heart towards those? Or do you fill your lung, you puff up your, you puff up your chest, and you say like the Pharisees, you are a curse, you are lower than nothing because you don't know as much as I do. 
have a humble, super humble attitude towards those that know less than you. See, even Jesus. Now, here's the thing about Jesus. Not, not that Jesus knew more. Jesus knew everything. Everything. Look for his angry. Look, look, look where. Look one instance in which he was proud towards those that came to him humbly. You don't find one. But usually he would give like a... On those that came already puffed up towards him. Oh, yeah, those... One, one instance he called them children of the devil. That, that's, that's a slap. But those that approached him with humbleness, he was so, so humble. Let us learn from the humbleness and the meekness and the humility of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, would you make us more like you? Lord Jesus, your humility is the most phenomenal. Lord, you are living water. You, you are living God. People were divided about you. People said horrible stuff about you. But Lord Jesus, we want to affirm that you are God. The only begotten Son. The King of kings, Lord of lords. The one who was, is, and is to come. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end and everything in between. The door of the sheep, the life, the love, the way, the truth, and the life. The prophet, the Christ, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, Prince of Peace. The son that was given, the one that carries the government on his shoulders. Mighty God, strong tower, the banner of your people, the God who provides. God, you provide so well that you provided yourself. And when you told Abraham to provide, you stopped Abraham. But when you told your son to provide, you didn't stop him, you, you let him go all the way. Lord, we want to learn from, we don't want to learn from the children of Abraham. We want to heard from the God of, we want to listen, we want to hear, we want to, Learn from the God of Abraham. Blessed be your name, almighty God. Make us more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.